Chairman, and I yield back the, bur ba the balance of my time. The gentlelady yields back the balance of her time. We will recess until 2.30 so everyone can get a bite of lunch. Stand in recess. The committee will come to order. Um, I think the last speaker was uh, on the Republican side, so we'll go to Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me just say uh, at the onset that I welcome these hearings, and I believe that they are long overdue. I welcome the start of these hearings not only for the fact that I believe some legitimate campaign fundraising violations may have occurred, but also for the fact that this committee has wasted millions of dollars during unprecedented delays and disorganization. I also want to state that this committee should have conducted bicameral hearings with the Senate. I commend my colleagues on this side of the aisle, Mr. Condit and Mr. Towns, for calling for a joint House Senate hearings because it is the American taxpayer who suffers in wasted money and energy. My constituents sent me to Washington to allocate their dollars in a prudent manner. We must be cost efficient and effective. It is my hope this committee will conduct balanced and fair investigations that will produce answers rather than more controversy. While that is my hope, when I consider the fact that the lead counsel for the Republicans has already quit the former uh, lead counsel and said that he does not believe that we are uh, proceeding in a fair way, it does concern me. And by the way, that was not from the Washington Post. It was not from some newspaper. That's from a Republican who was on the inside conducting the investigation. The investigation should help us reform our troubled campaign finance system. Instead, the investigation is proving to be a partisan waste of taxpayers' money. And I do become rather offended when allegations are made on the other side that we on the Democratic side are not about the business or not concerned about the business of finding the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. The fact is, is that we are very concerned. But our concern goes to trying to make sure that we do not, first of all, waste taxpayers' money, second of all, that we do everything in our power to be efficient, to resolve this matter, and for it to have some kind of results that make sense. At the rate we're going, it does not appear that that will happen. Over the last eight months, the majority staff members have hauled in numerous individuals and engaged in a fishing expedition in a frantic attempt to find anything they can to embarrass President Clinton. I have personally attended some of these inquisitions and seen these abuses. One of the depositions that I attended was that of Vernon Jordan, one of this country's most outstanding and honorable people. Mr. Jordan was interrogated for, interrogated for hours, even though he had not the slightest involvement in campaign finance. Not only have my Republican colleagues not attended a single deposition, they have continued to deny the American public access to these depositions. The American public should know that the majority has devoted millions of dollars of their hard-earned money. And I emphasize that, their hard-earned money, and they do not have much to show for it. The hearing that we will hold tomorrow is a sad attempt to portray a foreign government or foreign citizens to influence our last presidential election. From what I understand, we will hear nothing of the kind from these witnesses. Yet, this is the best we can do after eight months and millions of dollars spent. Mr. Chairman, the House is supposed to be an equal to the Senate. Yet, this fiasco makes us look like amateurs to the Senate, what has put, <clears throat> which has put on many weeks of substantive hearings and now winding down. Mr. Chairman, I know the American people expect more. We can do better. Thank you very much. I yield back the balance of my time.
Chairman yields back the balance of his time. Mr. Micah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the Government Reform and Oversight Committee is charged with the responsibility of conducting investigations, oversight, and the auditing of the performance of the executive and judicial branches of our federal government. This additional check over and above actions taken by Legislative and Appropriations Committee was established by our government founders nearly two centuries ago and is truly unique among uh, all democratic institutions. I believe that this separate investigative committee oversight, which constantly reviews and scrutinizes all our federal gov government activities is what keeps uh, us separate from be being really a banana republic. It is fundamental to, uh, to keeping our institutions honest, efficiently operated, and responsive to law. I believe that in the long term, it keeps our system and operation of government from becoming corrupt, inept, and self-destructive. To those who question the, the need to conduct these investigative hearings, I ask them only to review the purpose, history, and achievements of this committee in helping to keep our government honest and always subject to improvement. Yes, there are costs involved in this process, but I also submit uh, that under this new majority, this committee is operating with fewer staff and far less costs than expended by the previous majority. And I'd like to uh, offer exhibits uh, uh, for the record, since cost has become an issue here, uh, just for the record, and this information is from the clerk, during the 105th Congress, uh, we have uh, appropriated $11,702,000. During the 103rd Congress, when they were in charge for a two-year period, they spent $24,823,000. Last year, for the two total years, we spent $11,581,000. So the cost is a bogus uh, argument and the record and the facts uh, speak for themselves. Also, the number of staff that are uh, used, uh, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that Exhibit 1, uh, the cost and Exhibit 2, be inserted in the record that uh, they had far uh, greater uh, staff and resources than uh, we have used to conduct these uh, responsibilities and investigations. To those who question the further need to investigate this growing campaign scandal, I must submit that nearly every week the media discloses another sordid chapter for our committee to consider. Now to the fundamental question of why we are conducting this in investigation. Many existing laws have been broken. The application of certain laws have been questioned, and this scandal may in fact be unprecedented in scale, not to mention the shadow it's cast over our electoral process and over this administration. Some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle contend that this committee's investigation into the 1996 election campaign finance violations should not take place. I submit that the very foundations of our electoral process and integrity of our representative form of government may have been compromised. Wet laws have been broken. Let me cite a few examples and I have here copies of our federal statutes. First, we know that there were violations under 2 United States Code uh, uh, 441. This statute prohibits the contributions in the name of another person. We have obtained documented evidence that donors were reimbursed for contributions in both the Buddhist temple case and in uh, the Michael Brown pleadings. Witnesses tomorrow will testify under a grant of immunity that they made conduit payments. These payments, too, are prohibited under this statute. Does this statute work? Does this statute need revision? What went wrong? In May, Democratic fundraisers Nora and Jean Lum pled guilty to a felony charge that they conspired to defraud the United States and to cause the submission of false statements under the, uh, to the Federal Elections Commission. These are criminal acts in violation of 18 United States Code Sections 371 and 1001. The Lums were recently sentenced, and the Lums have tentatively agreed to cooperate uh, with this committee. Michael Brown recently pled guilty to violating uh, Section 
441 and uh, sections 437 of the Federal Elections Campaign Act, another violation of law. These provisions of uh, law limit the amount of money a person can contribute in a federal uh, candidate, to a federal candidate in an election. The funds for these Ill illegal activities were provided by uh, Brown, uh, to Brown by Nora and Jean Lum. We'll hear more about that. Brown will be sentenced again for these unlawful contributions in November. The committee also has evidence that suggests during the 1996 election, John Wong may have illegally solicited campaign contributions at the Democratic National Committee while still a federal employee at the Department of Commerce. This would be a violation of the Hatch Act. Violations in interpretation of the 114-year-old Pendleton Act, which prohibits soliciting campaign uh, contributions on federal property, also raise significant questions for this committee. Violations of current law are already well known and documented. I've only cited a few here and we've run out of space, but uh, uh, these are just a few of the laws that we know have been broken. The circumstances of the White House coffees, the Lincoln bedroom sleepovers, and possible campaign, uh, raise, campaign fundraising calls from the White House may have violated uh, 18 U.S. Code sections uh, 600, 607, and uh, section uh, 641 by compromising government access in return for campaign contributions by soliciting campaign contributions in a federal building and converting federal property, the White House, to private use. The bribery statute, uh, it is uh, uh, the 18, 18 of the uh, U.S. Code, Section 201, which prohibits federal officials, including the president, from receiving any benefit in return for any official action may have also been violated. In fact, we have numerous laws on the books that may have been violated. Our questions in these hearings must be, do these laws work, what went wrong, and how do we improve them? Those are the questions, and determining the facts and truth must be the responsibility of, uh, of this committee. Finally, what is particularly troubling to me is the failure to cooperate, the stonewalling, the attempted uh, blurring and obstructions cre that have been created to stop this legitimate oversight function. Not to mention that 11 witnesses with information relative to the 96 uh, campaign scandal have fled the country. Another 11 witnesses have refused to be interviewed by investigative bodies, and 36 Senate and House witnesses have, ass have asserted the Fifth Amendment. Excuse what has me, happened, what is being about, covered up, and why haven't the President and this administration, the Department of Justice and State, helped us locate these uh, folks? In closing, Mr. Chairman, the committee has evidence that strongly suggests that laws were broken in 1996. We are now learning that the whole electoral process may have been purposely subverted. We need to conduct these hearings to learn what laws were broken, if these laws are adequate, if the system is broken, and to ensure that corrective measures are taken and responsibility and ac accountability prevail. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, I time yield has back expired. the balance of my time. <laughs> you yielded your time a long time ago. Mr. Towns. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I would like to use the same clock that uh, Mr. Micah used. <laughs> let, let, let me just say, reset the clock for Mr. Towns. Let me just say that. Uh, uh, I really would appreciate it if we could stick as close to the five-minute rule as possible. I've been as lenient as I could be, but uh, uh, since we have 44 members on the committee, 43 that are here, uh, you know, we really do have some time problems. So let's stick as close to the five-minute rule as we can. I'll try to be as lenient as possible, but we've got to get through this. Right, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I will try and cooperate. I unequivocally support a thorough and comprehensive investigation into alleged campaign finance abuses of all individuals, and I want to make that very clear. When I took that sacred oath 10 months ago, I pledged, as I have for eight successive terms, to uphold the law and to advocate on behalf of our fellow Americans. Well, since that time, I've spoken to and I've listened to our constituents, and I can say without 
any reservations whatsoever that they are tied of partisan bickering. As hardworking Americans confront and resolve the problems of their lives, I believe they would like to see us similarly dedicate ourselves to problem solving instead of personality slandering. So I come to you today as someone with institutional history. I have witnessed the outcomes of numerous investigations, and I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to pause just for a moment, just one moment, from the haste to bring skeletons out of the closet and to beat the other guy to the punch to ask yourself, what is our obligation to the American people, the folks that sent us here? What is our mission? Is our purpose to bring about true campaign reform? Or are we simply consumed with focusing on certain individuals? If the answer is, as I truly hope, that our obligation is true reform, then we must be fair and we must be honest. And work in the interest of our constituents, we must look beyond partisan differences. We are approximately one month away from a recess. As the lenses of American public are upon us, the committee is clearly out of focus. There has been request upon request and request for the request. For instance, there has been 554 requests for information, 298 subpoenas, 134 document requests, 685,000 pieces of paper have already been generated. And at least $2 million has been spent at the Department of Commerce alone, not thinking about the other agencies that are involved in it. Has any of this brought to any closure to accomplishing campaign finance reform? The answer to that is no. We now find ourselves in this precarious position of beginning hearings when most of us are still trying to determine the real issues. It is not fair to the subpoenaed witnesses, Manlin Fong, Joseph Landon, and David Wong. It is not fair to the public. In a democracy, it is unusually the will, it's usually the will of the people that determines a course of action that has not happened during this investigation. Please do not misunderstand me. Let me be clear. I, like most of my Democratic colleagues, I am ready to roll up my sleeves and get to work on one of the most challenging issues facing this body. But this cannot and will not happen until there is real dialogue between both sides of the aisle, not this upmanship thing that's going on. At the end, of the end of the end of the day, we must ask ourselves how we want to be remembered. I hope that we can say unequivocally that we were fair, that we were honest, and we were equitable in our treatment of all individuals involved. And let me close, Mr. Chairman, by saying I still feel that we are wasting taxpayers' dollars by not having a joint hearing with the Senate. It's a shame and it's a disgrace when I look at people that are going hungry in this country, people that have no shelter in this country, and that people cannot get medical care in this country, in many of our rural areas and many of our urban areas in this nation. And we're sitting here wasting taxpayers' dollars
I think it's something that we should think very seriously about. And at this time, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. I thank the gentleman for sticking close to his five minutes. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to commend you for holding these important hearings on the investigation into campaign finance improprieties and possible violations uh, of law. It would be nice if we could hold joint hearings with the Senate, but as you know, under the Senate rules, that committee disappears in a month. And with us just receiving information on videotapes and the stonewalling of releasing other information, that unfortunately makes it impossible. Also, if the Attorney General had appointed a special prosecutor and were looking into these and investigating them, our uh, oversight responsibilities would be different. Unfortunately, that's not the case. This committee is charged by the House of Representatives with general oversight responsibilities, which include the duty to conduct uh, investigations of this nature, and there's a long history of doing that. The revelations of campaign fundraising abuses, which began to trickle out just prior to the 1996 elections, have raised serious questions as to the practices employed during the 96 election cycle, especially by the Democratic National Committee and the President's uh, re-election campaign. We're all familiar with the reports of White House coffees, overnights in the Lincoln bedroom, and the campaign events held by nonprofit organizations. Having begun as an investigation propelled by the press, the campaign fundraising controversy and investigation has now been elevated to the Congress, both House and Senate, as well as to the Justice Department. The ultimate goal of these hearings is to get to the truth behind what happened during the 96 election cycle, no matter where the truth may lead. I believe it's important for the American people to know how their political leaders financed their campaign and whether or not any campaign finance laws were broken. This committee, in conjunction with the Senate Committee and the Department of Justice, can serve to shed the light of truth in questionable fundraising practices. It's extremely di disturbing to consider the possibility of foreign dollars being purposefully used in an attempt to influence the policies of the United States government. Along that vein, however, I feel compelled to caution against the broad allegations of linking Americans of Asian descent to this controversy. This is not a controversy limited to Asian Americans. The Asian American community is in reality a shining example of the American dream. And we must not allow this controversy surrounding the 96 elections to discourage Americans of any ethnic origin from participating in the political discourse of this nation fully. Having said that, I encourage any party interested in the truth to focus on what others have said about the validity of this investigation. In stark contrast to the President's own statements offering full cooperation with any investigation, the administration has instead been stonewalling this committee's attempts to review the elections of 1996. Again, this is not the committee's perspective or my perspective, but the assertions of numerous uh, editorials in the Washington Post and the New York Times. The Washington Post had this to say about the administration's handling of inconvenient facts surrounding the investigation. It puts up a false front, offers a misleading version of events. If and when that fails, as often occurs, it puts up another and another, as many as it takes. Then administration officials bemoan the cynicism with which they have and they have to say is so often greeted with and wonder aloud or pretend to wonder why they are not believed. The dispensing of truth and reluctant dribs and drabs does indeed have the corrosive effect that the White House itself periodically deplores. That's the Washington Post in January. A few days later, the White House at first would play dumb, claim not to have known anything about the episode, whatever it was, and then, confronted with evidence to the contrary, would dole out the truth a grudging grain at a time when it spoke the truth at all. In April 3rd, the Washington Post, they, the White House, put out a story that may or may not be technically true, but creates a false impression. They benefit from that impression, which is allowed to stand for as long as it serves, meaning until it is shot down or about to be shot down. The New York Times also questions the integrity of this administration's willingness to cooperate with a review of fundraising practices. One editorial entitled, An Instinct to Deceive, what will it take to persuade the White House to tell the truth simply and promptly once a scandal is brewing? Apparently not even the advice of two lawyers of uncontested loyalty to President Clinton can overcome the cover-up instinct that has made a quagmire of whitewater and is turning the Indonesian fundraising affair into a matter that neither Congress nor the Attorney General can ignore. It was November 20th, and in July 3rd of this year, the New York Times says the pattern here is familiar. New information keeps dripping out while the White House argues that the investigations into Clinton finances have gone on too long. This investigation is not just a case of the Congress being interested in the fundraising practices employed during the 1996 election cycle for partisan gain. This is an investigation that is being driven by careless disrespect for our nation's current fundraising laws and by the inability of the parties involved to simply comply with a judicious review of the events surrounding the 1996 elections. The New York Times has even gone so far as to call the Clinton-Gore re-election campaign the most reckless presidential fundraising operation in recent history. 
of July 17, 1997. I personally hope this is not true. So far, however, the White House and the DNC have acted in a manner that would lead us to agree with the New York Times. If the White House would have us believe that improprieties are confined to a limited number of individuals, the administration must be more forthcoming. The first hearings will focus on legitimate issues surrounding the apparent laundering of campaign funds through third parties. The use of conduits for illegal contributions may, however, just be a small part of a larger picture surrounding the 1996 elections. This committee, in the absence of an independent counsel on this matter, must continue to ask the question, who knew what and when did they know it? Again, this is not just the view of this committee. Look at what others have said about this controversy. The New York Times, July 24th. The documents also show the DNC's clear disdain for laws limiting contributions to candidates as opposed to political parties. Also said it was, in short, laundered money. More troubling still is the possibility that the White House did know. That was July 31st, New York Times. It's my belief that the statutory requirements needed to activate the independent counsel statute have been triggered. It's incumbent upon the Attorney General to avoid any appearance of impropriety and to recognize the professional duty to call for independent review of fundraising practices and the subsequent actions of involved parties, wherever they may be. The recent revelations surrounding the Vice President have only added fuel to the fire calling for an independent counsel. The New York Times has also recognized the growing concerns in regards to a potential conflict of interest on the part of the Justice Department. The Senate hearings, New York Times said August 3rd, the Senate hearings have also yielded fresh evidence that the White House and the Democratic National Committee chose to look the other way as funds flowed illegally from foreign sources into the Clinton re-election campaign, greatly strengthening the case for an independent counsel to get to the bottom of the entire mess. And on September 14th, the New York Times says, recent weeks have brought fresh evidence that the Democrats' justice investigators are either lethargic or over their heads. Even worse, Attorney General, General Reno's failure to seek an independent counsel to oversee the probe no longer looks like a principled assertion of faith in Justice's career staff. It looks like a political blocking operation to protect President Clinton and Mr. Gore from the vigorous investigation that would be aimed at any other office holder who has received so much suspicious money. In the Washington Post, October 7th, and now the White House has found and turned over to congressional investigators videotapes of some of the coffees the President gave for campaign contributors last year. They may be tapes of as many as 150 such events. The investigators asked for them months ago. Only now are they being disinterred. It's enough to give good faith a bad name. The attitude of this White House toward the truth whenever it is in trouble is the same. Don't tell it or tell only as much as you absolutely must or as helps. They keep asking indignantly, even a little petulantly over there why they're not believed as they keep putting out their successive versions of the story. Can anyone really believe that they don't have the answer to that? Can anyone believe this is on the up and up? I remain hopeful the Attorney General will trigger the independent counsel statute and that this controversy can be completely taken out of the political realm. But until such time, the administration's stonewalling should stop. And as the editorials I've quoted from the New York Times and Washington Post uh, that I quoted earlier make clear, the White House has come perilously close to obstruction of justice, and this should stop. The sooner we get the facts out, the sooner we can resolve this matter, and the sooner we can put it behind us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. I join with uh, my fellows on this side of the aisle, as well as those on the other side of the aisle, in saying that uh, lawbreaking ought to be exposed and brought to justice. It is our duty. Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. But from the beginning of this investigation, I've wished that this committee could work in a relatively bipartisan manner that our counterparts with the Thompson Committee and the Senate have done, and that we not duplicate efforts undertaken by the Senate, and that we be respectful of taxpayers' dollars in the process. Unfortunately, uh, none of my wishes have uh, yet come true. After more than $2.5 million of taxpayer money has been spent, mostly by uh, the majority of this committee, after numerous depositions were taken at the uh, initiative of the majority, uh, without, I might say, a significant yield, after numerous hearings have been scheduled and then postponed, after almost all the committee action has been decided unilaterally and solely on the basis of the majority's wishes, and after the document protocols negotiated by Mr. Chairman and agreed to by the minority uh, were scuttled, I arrive at this moment with uh, some degree of skepticism. I have uh, read the New York Times and Washington Post editorials that have been cited. 
I've also read New York Times and Washington Post editorials which cite uh, the problems I've just articulated with the uh, committee process itself. This committee's investigation is challenged to prove that it is more than partisan. Uh, with respect to the investigation subject and comparison with past investigations, uh, the Watergate investigation was a bipartisan investigation. That's why it was successful. That's why it achieved a cleansing of the American political process. This is not in any way to dismiss the committee's right to investigate. As a member of this committee, I claim that right, and I share with the claiming of that right by every other member. But while we claim that right, we ought to be right in the way in which we proceed. Now, Mr. Uh, Chairman and members of this committee, I come to the Congress with a background in speech and communications. I uh, taught communications at Cleveland State University and Case Western Reserve University, and therefore I'm very sensitive to uh, all manners of communication and the way in which communication is presented. And I say that uh, in, the, in this context. I watched the beginning of this uh, committee's work earlier in the day. And I saw a presentation which disturbs me greatly because it raises questions as to matters of fairness. I want to say I believe that uh, Mr. Chairman is a fair person. I sincerely believe that. But there was a presentation put together here which uh, I don't believe was fair. Uh, the presentation where we saw the uh, uh, image of Mr. Uh, Huang or Wang uh, appeared as a mugshot. It was grainy, was somewhat smeared. I'm sure that the, the gentleman who has been the subject of so much publicity, uh, there would have been pictures available which could have presented him in a more dignified way, notwithstanding his actions. And I ask whether that's fair. Is it fair to have pictures of uh, Mr. Hubble and President Clinton high-fiving each other, flashed on that screen, while at the same time discussing possible criminal violations. Now think about that. What that does is it sends out a message, uh, certainly undignified and unfair, but it discolors the investigation by giving a false impression of complicity. President of the United States high-fiving someone who's under investigation. We should not proceed with this investigation in a manner which smears people, which causes conclusions to be drawn by images that we put forward to the public. We can proceed in a manner which goes with the facts to the facts. Otherwise, we've discolored the investigation and created an Alice in Wonderland environment of first rendering a verdict and then asking for the evidence. Is it fair that another Asian businessman, Mr. Tree, when his picture was uh, uh, flashed on that screen and, uh, in violation of uh, certain rules, as Mr. Kanjorski said, but his picture was distorted and blurred in this TV presentation. Now, the two Asian Americans were presented on the screen and their pictures were blurred and distorted. Now, you know, com computer technology today is a wonderful thing. You can clear up a picture, you can distort a picture. You can switch heads with people. You can put a person in a picture who wasn't in that picture. We certainly could have in a presentation a picture which does not distort. Abraham Lincoln was quoted earlier with respect to finding the facts. I, too, would like to quote Abraham Lincoln. When he looked at a, uh, at a moment of conflict in this nation, he said, with malice towards none. We can't proceed with this investigation without being malicious. We can get at the truth without trying to rip people to pieces. We need to keep in mind that there has to be a higher calling to our presence here. And that is to not just find out what was wrong, but to set what was wrong right through addressing a system that is inherently flawed. And until we are willing to do that, until we're willing to make that connection between the problems which are brought before us, yes, the breaking of the law which is brought before us, and a resolution of that through cleaning up the system, this whole matter would be an exercise in vain. 
I thank the chair. Gentleman's time has expired, Mr. Uh, chairman. Uh, the gentleman from Indiana. Mr. Chairman, I have a parliamentary inquiry before I. The gentleman will state start. his parliamentary inquiry. Um, there was a discussion about the grainy pictures. My understanding from having done some of this on the floor, talked with the committee uh, and others, is, is that it's been very difficult to get pictures of the president uh, with the individuals or the vice president with the individuals, or for that matter, a picture of Mr. Wong, and that all we have are newspaper photos which come out grainy when we reprint them. Uh, is that the case, and is that why we used grainy photos? The, the photos that we, uh, we used were from uh, public sources. Uh, it was not intentional that we tried to put them in a grainy mode. Thank the chair. Would the, uh, uh, in inquiry to the chair? Uh, yes, sir. General State is inquiry. Uh, you know, again, I, I understand the chair has a wonderful background in public service, but uh, I would suggest, Mr. Chairman, as we, and to my dear colleague, that as we proceed, that care be taken in these matters so as not to leave a mistaken impression that we're trying to achieve something uh, one way through images that we wouldn't dare try to achieve through our rhetoric. Well, the gentleman's point is well taken. We will do our best to make sure we show fairness whenever we show a photo of anybody that's under investigation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Indiana. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to this much anticipated inauguration of this important committee investigation to hearing from our first witnesses tomorrow. The White House has hoped to deceive the public into believing that everyone breaks the law. The President waxes piously about the need for an overall of overhaul of campaign finance laws, the moral equivalent of a bank robber who, once apprehended, touts himself as an expert on banking reform. Rule number one is follow the current law. Our oversight function in this committee is not campaign finance reform. It is to find if current laws were broken by this administration and why. We have oversight over this administration and its agencies. Then if we find that these are require new laws, then new laws arise out of that. But first you have to do the investigation. I didn't see a lot of members on the other party during Watergate suggesting they investigate past administrations, for example, President Johnson's bugging of Barry Goldwater and the cover-up after that. The goal of the Oversight Committee is to look into the oversight of the current administration. And what we see on the surface is an abuse that looks overwhelming. Overnights at the Lincoln Bedroom, coffee clutches, hard money, soft money, Citizenship USA, the Pendleton Act, the Hatch Act, Buddhist temples, photo ops with felons, Roger Tamara as an Interpol, Nora and Jean Lum, the Teamsters and DNC, conduit payments, money laundering, and videotapes. It's hard to keep track of all the Byzantine dimensions of this problem. As we look at the recent things and problems, such as a memory call problem with the DNC chairman and the missing videotapes of the coffee clutches, allegedly misfiled under Democratic fundraising, raise the questions of obstruction of justice and conspiracy to mislead congressional investigators. And for those who would try to compare this to the conduct of any previous administration, Republican or Democrat, please, don't even try. This is much more comprehensive. And we should be, unlike the Attorney General, who now appears to be regulate, uh, regulated to serving as the President's Defense Consul, has declined repeatedly to appoint an independent consul as the law requires, we need to investigate the burgeoning fundraising scandals regardless of what she does because she has now put the task to us unless she'll appoint the independent consul. We have some very critical questions. Did a foreign government or governments through agents of influence succeed in buying access to the Oval Office? And did this penetration compromise U.S. security? Never before in the history of this country has Congress been presented with a scandal of such breathtaking magnitude, complexity, and pervasiveness. Nearly every agency of government appears to have been debased by some degree with the stench of political corruption. This committee's work has been nearly crippled by the remarkable disappearance of or lack of cooperation from 60 witnesses with first-hand knowledge of the fundraising scandal. Like Colombian drug cartel leaders who boastfully call themselves unextraditables, many of Mr. Clinton's most generous donors and most energetic fundraisers have spirited themselves away from American territory to China, to Thailand, or back to Indonesia, beyond the reach of committee lawyers, subpoenas, and depositions. Then people want to know why it's taking us so long. They're fleeing our nation, and they're, they're obstructing our ability to do justice in the United States. Among those, John Wong, formerly of the Commerce Department in the Lippo Group. Mr. Wong has taken the Fifth Amendment. 
A memo by Mr. Wong, a prodigious fundraiser for the President's re-election, showed his asking for over $153,000 in foreign money from Lippo, Indonesia, to be wired to his accounts at Lippo Bank, specifically earmarked for the DNC. DNC pledged to return a $250,000 contribution from a South Korean businessman, which originated at Mr. Wong's suggestion. Another key figure is Charlie Tree, a restaurant owner from Little Rock, Arkansas, and a friend of Bill's. Mr. Tree absconded from the country and is said to be in China. Mr. Tree made hundreds of thousands of dollars of illegal donations to the Democratic National Committee and delivered bags and envelopes full of small checks and money orders totaling nearly $800,000 to Clinton's Legal Defense Fund. Some money orders were numbered sequentially, although they ostensibly came from individuals in different states who shared the same surname. Tree was awarded with an appointment to the President's Commission on U.S. Pacific Trade and Investment a policy which further gave him credibility and clout. We already know the tree donations coincided with the letter faxed to the President urging restraint in responding to China's military exercises off Taiwan's coast prior to his first Democratic elections. And finally, there's Johnny Chung, a political operative known best for his apt quotation comparing the White House to a subway station. Quote, you have to put coins in to open the gate. Mr. Chung vows his contributions were solicited by the DNC Finance Director Richard Sullivan, despite the fact that the National Security Council aide described him in a memorandum as a hustler trying to ex exploit his White House contacts. After the hustler memo, after the hustler memo, Chung was received 20 more times at the White House for a total of 49 visits. The responsibility of this investigatory body is to find out what laws were broken, what if any breaches of national security occurred, and whether important policy compromises were made as a repayment for illicit campaign donations. And I hope we can have a bipartisan effort. The Attorney General, the nation's top enforcement officer, has shirked her constitutional responsibility. We cannot afford to shirk ours. Bipartisan cooperation requires both sides, not just one side, and I hope some members on the other side have the courage, like Republicans did under Watergate as, as it unfolded, to step forward and to help us in this investigation in getting the truth out, if that, even if that means extradition and help of the State Department at some point. I yield back. Jim, yields back the balance of his time. Uh, Mr. Owens. Chairman, I'd like not to be redundant. Uh, I think that these hearings could be of great importance we deal with the underlying issue and not allow them to become trivial. This is a vital life and death issue with respect to the survival of our democracy, the issue of how elections take place and who pays for what. The issue is how, what is the influence of big money in our democracy. The issue is how does laissez-faire work uh, the other way. We, we, we've all been schooled in the doctrine of laissez-faire in terms of government leaving the marketplace and the private sector alone, but we've never talked very much and there's not been very much discussion uh, in colleges and universities about how do you avoid having the marketplace and the private sector take over government. Let's say fair should work both ways. And the real underlying problem of behind all the other details that we may discuss in this hearing is the problem of our government being for sale. Is our government for sale? And to what degree is it for sale? We had a Democrat in the White House who was determined that if he lost the election, he wasn't going to be because he was outspent. Or he wasn't going to be for lack of money. Not only the Democrats in the White House, the President and the Vice President were preoccupied with money, but every member of Congress. We had numerous discussions about Democrats taking back the Congress, and we had most of the uh, large parts of, and portions of those discussions related to money. That no matter what the merits were, no matter what our positions were, you still had to, had to have the money to get on television by the ads. Money becomes, begins to dominate uh, the political process in America. That's the real issue. That's what the American people ought to take a close look at. The details can take us into trivialities that sometimes are, are quite laughable. I agree with Harold Ickes uh, and Jay Leno or whoever started it and said that, you know, where did you expect the president and the vice president to make their calls from? You know, uh, they live in the White House. They live on government property. That's their home. Every member of Congress knows that they can't avoid some discussion of fundraising on federal property, even if you are so careful as never to discuss it yourself on the phone. You're going to get phone calls from other people who are going to discuss it. Are you going to hang up on somebody because they call you to say something about a, 
a fundraiser or a fundraising process. No, you're not. We go off the hill to make calls uh, at the various headquarters for the parties. We also go home to make calls. We probably make a large number of calls at home. The home of the president, the home of the vice president is, is the White House and, and the other facilities that are provided for the vice president. So it's a little ridiculous to single that out as being so important that it diverts us from the real issue of there's too much money required in American elections. Campaign spending has increased uh, exponentially, according to the Federal Election Commission. Spending in federal elections has increased from $309.6 million in 1975-76 to $2.738 billion in 1995-96. You know, at the same time the voter turnout is going down, the amount of money being spent uh, is, is going up. Independent expenditures have greatly increased. Uh, soft money, Republicans outraised Democrats in soft money in the 1996 election. Uh, 138.2 million to Democrats, 123.9 million in soft money. That's double what the parties raised in 1991-92. You know, tremendous amounts of money being raised. Nobody is giving it away uh, just because they're good Boy Scouts. There is a process uh, which uh, any uh, sophomore uh, in high school or college can tell you a process of expecting something back in return uh, for the money. The presidents throughout history have always had uh, various kinds of social activities in the White House. Uh, if we turn the microscope on any past presidents recently, we're going to find the same kinds of things that were done at the White House that we are blowing up out of proportion uh, here in terms of people being invited into the White House who have influence and who have uh, various other uh, kinds of things that the White House wants to, 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 to get, whether it's money or, or their influence in some, some respect. In terms of hard money, money spent by Republicans and Democrats, Republicans raised $416.5 million in 19, for the 1996 committee uh, uh, elections, while the Democrats raised $221.6 million. Uh, you know, the tremendous amounts of money are going into these, these elections. And the question that should be on everybody's mind as we take them through the steps of these uh, 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 hearings and we talk to the witnesses and uh, we reproduce and duplicate, replicate what the Senate has already done. The question should always be, you know, is this the kind of America we want, uh, which is clearly an America where the political process is up for sale? Uh, it, you know, if, if nothing else comes out of this, it ought to be the, the searing on the, on the imaginations and the minds of Americans of the fact that we are drifting into a situation where our democracy will inevitably be greatly distorted by the fact that you have these tremendous amounts of, one, of money that have to be raised. We must have campaign finance reform. 83% uh, 85 percent of Americans think that special interest groups have more influence than the voters. 92% uh, of Americans think too much money is spent on, on campaigns. Almost 9 in 10 Americans want fundamental change or a complete overhaul of the campaign finance system. Are we going to uh, engage these questions in this hearing? Uh, are we going to ask questions and do things with respect to the witnesses and the processes that we go through on this committee, which do in some way address this profound question? Is our government for sale? Is our democracy in danger? Because it is being taken over by the private sector with large sums of money. The laissez-faire that we are so proud of with respect to government not interfering with business is not going the other way. Business, money is trying to dominate our government, and that's the issue. I yield the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Major, uh, Major, Mr. Owens, excuse me. Mr. Scarborough. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I have uh, found the uh, speeches uh, from the Democratic side to be entertaining at the very least. Unfortunate in many cases, uh, a gentleman a couple of uh, a couple speakers ago talked about how he longed for bipartisanship. Well, I long for the type of bipartisanship also that was evident during the Watergate hearings when we actually had a senator in the minority that dared to stand up and ask tough questions of the president. What did the president know and when did he know it? Regrettably, all we hear are the, the most, uh, most frantic uh, charges of, I've heard partisanship, I've heard the word evil thrown around, I've heard witch hunt, 
and I've also heard fishing expedition. We were told a few minutes ago that children were starving across America because of these hearings. We were told that people were freezing and homeless because of these hearings. Uh, it's demagoguery at, at, at its worst. It's also uh, amounts to political obstruction of justice. And regrettably, we've seen this on, on this committee for some time. I remember when Chairman Klinger, a few years ago, uh, tried to get some documents pertaining to Craig Livingstone. We were, the same terms were used, that it was a fishing expedition, that it was a witch hunt. Later we find out, after this fishing expedition, after this so-called witch hunt, that the White House had illegally and improperly seized 900 FBI files against their political enemies. And yet, this continues. It's deja vu all over again. One Democrat has said, we can do better. Well, I say the Democrats can do better, and I'm going to make a plaque. It's going to be the, the Senator Joe Lieberman plaque for the first House member that actually stands up and shows the courage that Senator Lieberman showed on the Democratic side and that Howard Baker showed so many years ago. This is what Senator Lieberman said on the Senate side. Quote, the pattern of behavior by the White House is, as exemplified most recently in the question of these tapes is unacceptable also. One can hear the explanation given that it's a foul up and not a cover up, but the accumulation of foul ups begin to raise an understandable question in the mind of this committee, which, uh, which is what is going on over there and why does it happen? That's Joe Lieberman, the one Democrat that has shown a little bit of courage over the past few months. This shouldn't be about partisanship, and I agree with the gentleman. If a Republican did this, I would hold the Republican to the same high standard that I'd want to hold this president to. And if anybody doubts this, all they need to do is ask Newt Gingrich, Dick Armey, or other members of my leadership that I've given problems to over the past few months. You can also, if you think that this is about partisanship, that you think this is a Republican attack, all you have to do is read the newspapers to see what they're saying. Read what the Washington Post said yesterday when in so many words they accused the White House of lying. They said, quote, the attitude of this White House towards the truth whenever it is in trouble is the same. Don't tell it. Or tell only as much of it as you absolutely must. And then we of course had the New York Times last week who editorialized on their editorial page that Bill Clinton and Janet Reno could no longer be trusted to, to look in to the fundraising abuses that have occurred. We have had Newsweek going into it for a year now. Uh, they reported last year about possible espionage between a White House and DNC official and Communist China, explaining how this official would get briefings from the Commerce Department and then was stupid enough to step into a cab take a cab to the Chinese embassy, and then turn in the receipt to get some money back. And this happened over and over again, according to Newsweek. We've had press reports that the CIA, that the FBI, that the INS, that the NSC, that possibly the IRS, and obviously the office of the president, the office of the vice president, have been involved to assist the White House, possibly illegally, to elect the president and Democrats to Congress. And it expands, and it continues to expand, and all we hear is the same thing, witch hunt, or that it's evil, or that, or that it's partisanship. Uh, there is nothing partisan uh, about the New York Times. There's nothing partisan about the editorial page of the Washington Post. Of course, some of us would suggest that if there was any partisanship, it certainly would tilt heavily against the Republican Party. But to those editorial pages' credit, they have had the moral courage to speak out against an administration that has perhaps had the most corrupt fundraising machine in the history of this republic. Why can't one Democrat, and I see we only have one Democrat, so I throw this offer over to you. I will get the Lieberman Memorial plaque, give it to you after this hearing. Why can't we have one Democrat say something stinks at the White House Something is very, very wrong. Let's get to the bottom of it, and let's stop trying to change the subject. I mean, if I hear one more Democrat say, well, this is, this is a wonderful opportunity to re-examine campaign finance laws. That's like Marv Albert stepping out of the courthouse and saying, 
this is, I have provided us a wonderful opportunity to examine sexual harassment in America. I mean, let's stop trying to change the subject and instead get to the bottom of this issue, which is that this White House has, has continued in illegally using its influence to get reelected, to get Democrats reelected. And after the end of that process, then maybe we can look at campaign finance reform. Then we can look at putting even more new laws on the books. But before we do that, I say let's get a, let's get a White House and let's get Democrats that are willing to abide by the laws that we now have on the book. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you for that entertaining speech. Mr. No, I want to get this right. Blagojevich. Uh, thank is you, that, Mr. Is that pretty close? That's exactly on the mark, Mr. Mr. Blagojevich. Or Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, first of all, evidently, I'm all alone here. I think my colleagues on this side knew I was going to speak, and they left. Um, let me also say it was Mo Udall, I believe, who said that everything uh, has been said, but not everybody said it. I uh, will probably uh, do less than five minutes, and so many members on both sides have said a lot of the kinds of points I want to make. Uh, and let me just briefly comment on my uh, illustrious colleague from Florida, who I have, again, we hear this all the time, and I gen gen genuinely have high regard for Mr. Scarborough from Florida. He made the statement that if a Republican did this, he would be, I think, I'm paraphrasing now, outraged or something to that extent. The fact of the matter is this committee probably isn't going to find out whether or not Republicans did it or not because we're going after Democrats in this committee. Probably nine out of ten subpoenas that have been issued from this committee are earmarked towards Democrats and not Republicans. So I don't think my illustrious colleague from Florida will have the opportunity to be as outraged about a Republican. And I think when I quoted Mo Udall about saying uh, the same things that others have said. I'm going to repeat what virtually everybody on this committee and both parties have said. It is that we think that we ought to have an investigation, that many of these allegations are not only troubling, but potentially criminal in nature, and that, you know, that this investigation is important, that we have to find out what actually happened, uh, particularly uh, with regard to fundraising in, in the White House. There are, however, differences. Those of us here happen to think that we ought to not only investigate the White House, we ought to investigate the House, we ought to investigate Democrats and Republicans. Because when I go back home to my district, uh, and I've been back uh, every weekend since I've been elected with the exception of one, and when I appear at town hall meetings or community forums, I don't hear a single question, not a single question, about campaign uh, misdeeds in the White House or in Congress. And when I sometimes ask questions, because I want to have a sense of what people are concerned about, I get, I get a sense from the people back home that they just view this whole process as corrupt or corrupting. They view this whole process as ugly and dirty, and they think that we're all politicians just trying to raise money and that any excesses and transgressions that may have come out of the White House are just business in, as usual in Washington, D.C., and in politics in general. And I, I must say that... Uh, uh, I, I don't necessarily disagree with them. In fact, uh, these allegations about uh, whether or not big money's in the system, allegations about whether or not fu uh, fundraising and contributors buy access to government uh, is kind of reminiscent from, of the movie Casablanca, the scene where the Paul Andre character, uh, they're in Rick's Cafe, if you remember the movie, and they all start uh, playing the Marcia, and it's a very moving scene, one of the great scenes in movie history, and then when it's all over, the German officer is there, and, uh, he tells the Vichy representative, who was played by Claude Rains, the, uh, the uh, Captain Renault character, shut it down, shut down Rick's cafe. So he goes up to the Humphrey Bogart character, Rick, and he says, you know, uh, we're closing this place down. And uh, Humphrey Bogart says to him, uh, what are you closing me down for? What are the grounds? And uh, the uh, uh, Claude Rains character in a classic line says, Rick, I'm shocked. I'm shocked. There's gambling here. He just placed a bet earlier in the movie. The fact is that a lot of these allegations are not shocking at all. They are, in fact, a problem with the system, endemic to a system that needs reform. And I hate to disappoint my colleague from Florida, but if these investigations are going to have any merit at all, if we're going to learn anything from what we hopefully are going to discover from these investigations, I think it's only going to underscore what we already know, which is the system doesn't work. It's a system that is corrupting or corruptible, and it's a system that needs fundamental reform. And I. I'm joined by many other members who are willing to stay in this session beyond adjournment unless for, for as long as it takes to pass some kind of campaign finance reform in this Congress. And let me also say that there is a bipartisan effort, Republicans and Democrats alike, whether it's McCain-Feingold or the freshman version of, of Republican freshman and Democratic freshman, offering some kind of meaningful campaign finance reform. 
in the post-Watergate era, Congress changed the rules. And they did it because the American people clamored for it. And I believe that unless and until the American people feel that we're going to do something about cleaning up a system that has gone wrong, they're not going to tune us in, and they're not going to be as willing to respond to some of the allegations that arguably are very, very serious. So I hope we can have campaign finance reform, Mr. Chairman, as we can continue this investigation. Uh, and I uh, yield back the balance of my time. Your statements on Casablanca were very accurate. Thank you. Mr. Shaddy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I begin, let me note that uh, for my colleague on the other side, eight out of the nine subpoenas issued by this committee may be directed to Democrats, uh, largely because eight out of nine of the articles that appear in the Washington Post, uh, the New York Times, the LA Times, and virtually every other newspaper in this country where there are investigative reporters at work focus on abuses and violations of law by Democrats. So uh, I think uh, it is quite logical. Mr. Chairman, make no mistake about it. This investigation and these hearings go to the very heart of the survival of this nation. While I do not wish to raise expectations about the nature of the information that will come out of these hearings, the essence of the hearings addresses the integrity of our system of government and the faith, confidence, and respect it commands from the people of this nation. If the people do not believe that our government is honest, their motivation to abide by its laws will be destroyed. In our system of government, order is maintained by voluntary compliance with law. If that compliance is abandoned, anarchy will prevail. If the people believe our government is corrupt, liberty will not survive. Again, let me make it absolutely clear. Whether we, pr we produce shocking evidence proving violations of the law occurred or not, the issue is maintaining credibility within our system of government. The evidence which is already in the public domain suggests that our campaign finance laws were abused and corrupted to an unprecedented degree in the 1996 election. Sadly, this process has become hopelessly partisan. An immense effort has been and is being expended in trying to prevent the truth from coming out. And when evidence is brought out, every effort is made to minimize its significance to the greatest extent possible. The subject of these hearings is not new to me. For eight years, I served as Special Assistant Arizona Attorney General. In that capacity, I was specifically responsible for enforcing Arizona's campaign finance laws. During that time, there were two major revisions of our campaign finance laws, which produced some of the strictest and most rigid campaign laws in the nation. In both cases, proponents of the reforms claimed that with these radical new limits, the cost of campaigning would decrease. Time has shown, however, that not only did the cost of political campaigns in Arizona not go down, but in fact, it has increased. But more importantly, these so-called reforms drove a large portion of campaign spending underground. Prior to the changes in our law, it was easy to determine where campaign contributions came from and where they went. Regrettably, following reform, this information is almost impossible to ascertain. For example, there are now countless nice-sounding organizations that act as fronts for the very special interest groups the law was intended to affect. Just one such organization, called Citizens for Excellence in Education, was nothing more, as many of them are nothing more, than a front for another organization. In this case, the Arizona Education Association, from which it obtained all of its funding. In light of my personal campaign experience with campaign finance laws, I am greatly disturbed, indeed I am disgusted, by the concerted effort of the current administration and of some members of this committee to do everything possible to prevent this investigation from moving forward. Over and over again, to date, they have constructed roadblock after roadblock to obstruct this investigation. To thwart our effort, the White House has stonewalled repeated requests for information, concealed other information, and produced yet still more information only after the committee threatened contempt of Congress. Conversely, the administration has also engaged in a calculated effort to time the release of the information which the administration considers damaging so as to diminish its significance when brought forward by this committee in the course of these hearings. Just a week ago, there was an effort to force the release of committee depositions the moment they were taken. The obvious motive for that effort was to make any significant revelations at such a deposition old news and therefore insignificant when the committee hearing focused on that witness and the information the witness had produced. 
The recent release of videotapes of the White House copies is yet the latest example of foot dragging and obfuscation by the White House. From the time these copies came to light earlier this year, the White House spin operation denied that they were fundraisers. Yet, when administration officials searched the White House videotape database for copies, they found only 49 hits. By contrast, when they recently searched for DNC fundraisers, there were 150 hits. This, I suggest, is a stunning revelation that these events were viewed as political fundraisers by the White House itself. And, based on the audio from these now re revealed tapes, the people attending them obviously understood they were fundraising events. With one attendee, they were fundraising events. With one attendee, attendant audibly offering checks to a DNC official in the room. As the Senate hearings have shown, and as these hearings will show, there is one riveting fact this administration cannot escape. And that is, the information we have already seen demonstrates that the abuses which they, in which they were engaged and which have already come to light were in violation of current law. If current law had been filed, or if it were currently being enforced, this investigation would not be necessary. For my colleagues on the other side, who complain about the cost of this investigation, they should be reminded that it was the improper accidents, actions of the President, the White House, and the DNC that created any additional burden to taxpayers for the cost of these hearings. Our job as members of this committee is to oversee the executive branch of this government. It would be irresponsible for any of us to turn a blind eye to the blatant disregard for campaign finance laws as occurred in the last election cycle. As I said earlier, disregard of existing law, as some would suggest has been flagrantly demonstrated by this administration, erodes the public confidence and trust, which is essential for our survival as a nation. As Thomas Jefferson said, the whole art of government consists in the art of being honest. Mr. President, we simply ask that you be honest. Let me conclude, Mr. Chairman, by noting that the appointment of a special prosecutor is long overdue. The latest refusal of Attorney General Janet Reno, which followed only hours later by the release of the White House videotapes, establishes beyond a doubt that the Attorney General and the Department of Justice are not doing their jobs. More importantly, not only is Janet Reno not doing her job, she is showing contempt for the law and destroying public confidence and faith in our system of government. Mr. Chairman, I close with a plea to everyone involved in this process, from the White House to the Attorney General and the Department of Justice to the members of this committee to do what is what right, proper, and honest. The future of our nation is at stake. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. We gather here today, nine months after the initial investigation of allegations of campaign finance abuses from the 1996 election cycle. $2.5 million of the taxpayers' hard-earned money already spent 57 depositions have already been taken, and several witnesses have been unduly harassed. While I am encouraged that the hearings will finally begin, I cannot help but remain somewhat pessimistic. And I say pessimistic because I do not believe that these hearings will reveal anything that has not already been brought forth by the Senate investigation. The Senate has said what most Americans already know, and that is that our campaign finance system in America is badly broken and in serious need of repair. The real issue before us today is not conduit payments to the Democratic National Committee. Rather, when will we begin to have serious debate on reforming the campaign finance laws? I believe that we have an opportunity to seize the moment and provide real reform if the people are to believe that we're serious. It is no secret that the current system of campaign finance laws are seriously flawed. These laws threaten the very essence of our democracy. It is imperative that we reform the current system and send a message that this government is not for sale. We must eradicate the notions that money can buy justice elections, and anything else that you want in America. The current system has too much money in it. It is tantamount to capitalism 
run amok. This is perhaps capitalism at its very worst. This is the vultureness of capitalism, which undermines the very essence and ideas of democracy. We must send the message that no part of our government system can be bought or purchased. Campaign finance reform is one of the critical issues of the day. The stakes are too high for us to dally around and do nothing about it. There have been over 70 bills introduced in this country alone regarding campaign finance reform, and the leadership has yet to schedule debate on any of them. Perhaps Gandhi was right when he said, possession of power makes men blind and deaf. They cannot see things which are under their very noses and cannot hear things which invade their eyes. Seems to me that those in power want only to perpetuate it. However, I urge the American people to meet the power that wants to maintain the status quo with like and equal resistance that demands real campaign finance reform. History has thrust upon us, upon our generation, a unique and important destiny. That is the opportunity to complete a process of campaign finance reform to make democracy real in the lives of each and every American. This is our opportunity to make the magnificent words of the Constitution and Declaration of Independence ring true, that this is, in fact, a government by and for the people, not by and for the rich and wealthy, but by and for all the people irrespective of income, gender, or heritage. As the lights dim and the cameras fade on this hearing, I urge the leadership to give the people what they want, what they desire, and that is real campaign finance reform. And when we give the people what they want, when we give the people real campaign finance reform, they will know that the role they play is not contingent upon the size of their pocketbook or that their influence is not weighted by the size of their contributions. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The gentleman from, Mr. from Ohio, Mr. LaTourette. Thank you much, very much, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to see you seated in the chairman's chair. I uh, Thank you. appreciate very much the opportunity to make remarks today, and I also look forward to tomorrow's inaugural hearing. Uh, like many members of the panel who have already spoken today, I have been frustrated and saddened by the length of time it has taken to get to this juncture in the hearing process. However, unlike some of the statements that have been made today, I am not perplexed, nor do I wonder, uh, as to what the cause of the slowness of pace is, the cost, or the progress of the fact-finding process. My primary vocation uh, before coming to Congress was that of a county prosecutor. Like other members uh, who serve on this committee who had the honor and pleasure of representing uh, their state before the bench, there are many war stories that each of us could tell detailing the creative and imaginative tales that defendants from time to time had uh, to explain why they had missed their date with the judge. My personal favorite was a gentleman called up one day and said that a rather painful circumcision had prevented his arrival at the courthouse for two weeks, uh, but he hoped to be with us soon. What causes the uh, raising of suspicions and indeed raises the hackles of many of us on this side of the aisle is the constant evasion. A rule of thumb that I adopted in my uh, legal practice was given to me by a rather grizzled uh, homicide veteran by the name of Tommy Doyle. And he said that the reason that people lie, the reason that people hide the truth, the reason that people prevaricate uh, is that the truth is worse for them than the lie which they're willing to tell. Sadly, the conduct of many during the public uh, observance of this series of scandals has put me in mind of many of the wayward defendants of the past and I would suggest has had more than a direct result of impeding the orderly progression of any legitimate or worthwhile probe. We have seen people who have fled the country in the jurisdiction of this Congress. We have seen those who would choose to use the Fifth Amendment as a sword rather than as a shield, to frustrate rather than to protect. We have seen a variety of statements that would put some of my old defendants to, sh to shame. I don't recall facts or events as one. There's no controlling legal authority. 
everybody does it is something that I've heard from my children on many occasions, and that the Pendleton Act is obscure, antiquated, or vague. And if I had a nickel for every defendant who claimed that the law under which he or she was being investigated or prosecuted was vague, I would have been retired long ago. But perhaps the classic was in today's Hills newspaper, and I never thought I'd see this from anywhere, certainly on Capitol Hill, other than from my children, uh, the uh, caption that the dog ate my videotapes. Certainly we reached a new level of excuses in this investigation. As a youngster, I remember being fascinated by a photograph that appeared in one of the papers of Rosemary Woods, who was, of course, the, the secretary to President Nixon during the Watergate hearings. And the musings of the, uh, the bemused editorial writers was that Ms. Woods must have had some gymnastic ability uh, to go reach back and, and somehow cause a gap of uh, minutes long in an audio tape for a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder that was, was located behind her desk. I look forward to the coming weeks uh, because the bizarre compilation and editing of the videotapes just recently revealed, released by the White House, I suspect will demonstrate skills by their video technicians that will rival the Corbett's, the Comaneci's, and the Rettens. Mr. Chairman, I would suggest that between the two extremes, uh, and that is those within and without Washington that want these hearings to get the president and to get the vice president, and those within and without Washington that will protect the president at all costs and would suggest we do nothing to follow the trail of illegality, the vast majority of members on this committee and in this House hope that the fact-finding process will develop a discovery of who has violated the laws already in existence and that those who have sworn an oath to uphold the laws of this country do their job and do so. Whether or not American policy and secrets were sold for electoral success in November of 1996, and that those who stonewall, obstruct, and obfuscate are publicly condemned and driven from office. And finally, that the flawed manner in which we finance our federal campaigns be examined in the orderly and thoughtful manner that is the hallmark of this institution, and that reform be the child of bipartisan labor rather than the spawn of media-driven, partisan advantage-seeking quick fixes that sound good but at the end of the day, fail to restore the trust in the way we finance campaigns in this country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. And the gentleman from, Mr. from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't want to belabor this point, which uh, seems to be something we're all uh, doing a bit of here today, but I largely associate myself with the remarks of my colleagues uh, that have been covered that I'd otherwise raise in particular the unfair manner of presentation of information that we've seen that's been suggestive uh, and predisposed to a preconceived conclusion. Uh, the dupl du duplication of the independent counsel's inquiries and the Senate's parallel inquiry, the slow and unfocused proceedings that we've had here, including numerous lengthy depositions that result in either little or no information that's new or relates information which has already been unearthed elsewhere and reported publicly, the expenditure of millions of dollars of taxpayers' money to do what the Senate has already done, while not ever criticizing the Senate's job is insufficient. I want to point out that this is not the Oversight and Oversight Committee. It is, in fact, the Oversight and Reform Committee, and that we should be not duplicating what the Senate has done. We've said this since the beginning and had of over 100 other members of Congress try to persuade this committee to either unearth something new that we haven't heard before, to have this be a nonpartisan approach so that what we do here can be credible, uh, to include us in on the planning of this so that we can get beyond what seems to be the inability of the majority here to conduct an investigation that leads to anything new uh, that the American public can look forward to, uh, to either join with the Senate to do its investigation with it so that we don't duplicate money and spend mo resources unnecessarily, or refocus this investigation away from duplicative efforts and into things that are new and will lead us in some direction, that expand it out beyond just the role in the White House to take a look at what happened in the, in the House of Representatives and in the Senate and in both parties, uh, to go beyond that and to move forward. We can stipulate, the American public can well stipulate that the campaign finance system that we have right now is not one that they enjoy or that they think is working particularly well. We can stipulate that both parties have probably had abuses that if they're not unlawful are certainly unseemly, and that this goes back to not the past election, but to elections before that. And I think that the numbers are there, the information has been made public, and nobody is now surprised any longer 
uh, by what this committee is coming up with other than the fact that they're surprised probably to learn that most of these witnesses have already been deposed and investigated by the Senate. Most of these witnesses are giving us information that has already been disclosed to the press and to the Senate and to the fact that we're not unearthing anything new. Let's agree to, uh, to the fact that we need to move beyond this into a better system. Let's agree that we can do it a lot more economically than we've been doing it. Let's agree to stipulate to what we can stipulate instead of having shows so that we can get our face on the TV and move this forward to either new information or to a cooperative effort with the Senate so that we can preserve resources. And then let's do something that this committee is designed to do. It is a group that has had referred to it several campaign finance reform proposals, including one of my own that would, in a large way, reform the way that we fund campaigns here and give back integrity to the system and encourage people to once again be involved as voters and as candidates, the sense that they own their campaign system and that they can move forward here with some confidence that what we do here is in fact their business and not the business of hard money or soft money contributors to either campaign or either party. We can do that. We should do that. Uh, we could certainly use the taxpayers' money better by having a simultaneously track and simultaneous track in this House of campaign finance reform considerations while the Senate is going either with our help or on its own to doing the rest of the work in terms of the investigation. That's what we can do. That's what we should be doing. Uh, and I will yield uh, to my colleague here if he wants to make a point that we were discussing earlier about the fact uh, that we are really looking at here some 30 checks uh, that may be questionable out of uh, how many well, I, I you think mentioned that earlier. Just, I just wanted to add to the record that, as I understand it now, that there are over 2.7 million individual contributors and therefore checks to the uh, DNC in the election cycle, and some 130 of them are the subject of matter of... Uh, the uh, refunded dollars and the questionable contributions. And that's not to minimize anything, any illegality that may have taken place, but to put in context some of the uh, more outrageous uh, suggestions about the lacks of uh, controls and so on. Uh, you know, the vast majority of checks that were uh, raised and uh, processed through the DNC uh, were correct and appropriate contributions. And that what we're really talking about is something less than 2% less than of all of the con contributions uh, being in question. And so uh, as we go forward, uh, I think we should root out whatever, uh, whatever wrongdoing may have taken place on all sides, uh, but we should also keep in context that uh, for the most part this was an election run by the DNC in which uh, even with all of these complicated regulations and rules uh, that they did their best to, uh, to comply with. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New Hampshire, Mr. Sununu. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me begin with two, uh, two brief points. Uh, one is in response to the notion that somehow this committee is not uncovering anything new. Uh, we can cut right to the chase. The three witnesses we're going to hear from this week were not contacted by the Senate. They were not contacted by DOJ. They have not testified before the Senate committee. Uh, their testimony will be new. Uh, their information uh, that they'll have to offer us is important, and uh, there are many other uh, revelations, I think, that will come out of this committee, but the fact is we're getting right to uh, new and important information immediately in this, this hearing. Uh, the second point I'd like to make, and I'll emphasize it later in my marks, is uh, uh, to uh, counter the assertion that has been made repeatedly uh, today and, and it's fundamentally flawed. And that assertion is that somehow a loophole is an invitation to violating the law. Nothing could be further from the truth. A loophole, however objectionable we may find it, is simply an invitation to take advantage of a loophole. A loophole isn't an invitation to accept illegal conduit payments. It's not an invitation to accept illegal contributions uh, from a, a foreign citizen. Uh, a loophole itself is not an invitation to violate the law and to suggest uh, that it is in, in some way, shape, or form is to misunderstand uh, the nature of our law and our obligation to obey those laws. Mr. Chairman, today's hearing marks the beginning of a public phase of what has been a long and difficult investigative process. Our committee is challenged with the formidable task of shedding light on a series of campaign finance abuses. This effort is made even more difficult by two significant factors. One, the complex nature of political ca campaigns, especially those that are national in scope. And second, the degree to which this committee has been uh, obstructed in its investigation. 
During the past year, the public has heard testimony detailing illegal fundraising events on church property, illegal campaign contributions made through false donors, illegal contributions made by non-citizens, and illegal laundering of union funds for political campaigns. These events are not alleged. This information is not hearsay. Testimony includes many eyewitness accounts, campaign committees have returned illegal funds, and fundraisers have pled guilty to felony charges. The breadth and scope of these abuses are unprecedented since the implementation of Watergate era campaign reforms. Those who suggest the system made them do it are all too willing to ignore the fundamental legal and moral obligation we have to obey the law. Those who claim that changing campaign rules would address our concerns fail to understand the difference between using rules to one's advantage and violating federal law. Are we to believe that if Congress fails to change the rules this year, then the DNC and its fundraisers will be forced to continue to violate the law? Of course not. A campaign that's willing to accept illegal soft dollar contributions will be equally willing to accept illegal hard dollar contributions. It's time for those that have violated the law to begin taking responsibility for their actions. Those in positions of responsibility must take responsibility for providing answers to these critical and lingering questions. First, was there a planned effort to systematically violate campaign finance law? A single illegal contribution would be scant evidence of such a pattern. $50,000 or $100,000 an illegal, illegal contribution might raise concerns. To date, the Democratic National Committee has returned more than $2.8 million in improper contributions. Second, did senior campaign officials know of or condone illegal fundraising? During these past several months, echoes of denial, I don't specifically recall, it wasn't our intent, are deafening. Moreover, these claims stretch the limits of credibility. And finally, did any foreign government plan to improperly influence America's political system through an illegal fundraising network, and was such a plan carried out? Unfortunately, the work of this committee continues to be hindered by an unprecedented effort to avoid responsibility. Over 60 witnesses to these events have refused to tell Congress what they know, 22 individuals, have fled the country entirely or have gone into hiding. These are not the actions of innocent victims. They are the actions of conspirators with something to conceal. The committee has been further obstructed by delays in receiving critical documentation from the Democrat National Committee and the White House. Repeated refusals to promptly comply with committee subpoenas only suggest the existence of more damaging evidence. This week's production of White House fundraising videotapes three months after subpoenas were issued, only highlights the egregious nature of these obstructions. In the end, these tactics only serve to make us more determined in our effort to conduct a thorough and honest investigation of these matters. This is not a hearing about personalities, as some undoubtedly will charge. It's a hearing about securing answers to troubling questions surrounding the 1996 presidential campaign, which to date have received only vague and inadequate answers. The long-term health of our government is dependent on the ability of Americans to freely and fairly express their will through the election of our representatives. Illegal campaign fundraising undermines the credibility of the election process and of government itself. I look forward to hearing the testimony offered before this committee, and I certainly hope we can carry out our duty in a professional manner for the good of the American people. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. These past few days have not done much to inspire confidence in any branch of our government. The White House is engaged in inexcusable delays in turning over relevant evidence to the Congress. The Senate has killed bipartisan campaign finance reform with procedural devices. And meanwhile, the House of Representatives has not even considered a reform bill. Is it any wonder that people have lost confidence in our government? They are discouraged not only by periodic scandals, but by the day-to-day -day abuses committed in the unending quest for campaign cash. They are further discouraged by politicians who seem unwilling to reform a system that is clearly 
out of control. Every day, it seems, the cynicism grows, eroding the trust upon which our system of government depends. Democracy cannot survive without the trust and confidence of the people. We have an opportunity to regain some of that confidence today as these hearings begin if we will, are willing to proceed in a fair and bipartisan manner. Tomorrow, we're going to hear from witnesses who have admitted to making illegal contributions to the Democratic National Committee. Every Democrat on this committee will join me in saying that this illegal behavior is wrong and that it cannot be tolerated. We need to find out who was behind these illegal practices, how widespread they are, and how can we prevent them in the future. At the same time, I would hope that every Republican on this committee would join in admitting that this practice is by no means confined to the Democratic Party and that there are problems with our campaign finance system that go beyond the criminal actions of these witnesses. We need to remember that we are not here on behalf of the Republican or Democratic Party. We are here on behalf of the people who sent us here. We are here on behalf of the people who pay our salaries, and we are here on behalf of the people who are paying for this investigation. The American people want to find the facts. They want to know who is behind the illegal and improper fundraising practices that plagued the last campaign. And they want to know what we're going to do to prevent future abuses and to reduce the influence of big money on our democratic process. I have joined with members from both parties in seeking comprehensive reform of our campaign finance system. I've worked with the Blue Dog Coalition and the Bipartisan Freshman Task Force on bills that would ban soft money, require more disclosure, and address the other loopholes and abuses that exist under current law. Just yesterday, I and other members of the Blue Dog Coalition filed a modified open rule to bring all of the major reform proposals, Republican, Democratic, and bipartisan, to the floor of the House for an up or down vote. Next week, we will be seeking signatures on a discharge petition to bring this rule to the floor. And I invite everyone on this committee to join in that effort. These hearings, like the ongoing hearings in the Senate, will make two things clear. Campaign finance laws were broken, and the campaign finance system is broken. We should all be ready to address both of these problems in an aggressive and bipartisan way. That is our job. Mr. Chairman, I am hopeful that the work of this committee will be productive and that our singular goal will be to devise a campaign finance system that preserves and protects our nation's grand experiment in representative democracy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pappas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We in the Congress have a sacred responsibility to the American people. The Government Reform and Oversight Committee is investigating alleged improprieties and several of us have said we will pursue this investigation wherever they may lead. Our democracy was founded on the system of checks and balances, and we're in a situation where we need to check into potential abuses of a campaign finance system. The investigation is simply our responsibility as laid out under the rules of the House. Indeed, as the name of this committee states, we have an, a responsibility to oversee the executive branch. At the heart of this investigation lies a central question did illegal foreign contributions corrupt government policies? To answer this question, the actions of a complex web of government agencies, administration officials, and campaign aides must be untangled. As a member of the House National Security Committee, the notion that foreign donors might have tried to subvert the American political process to carry out their own agenda greatly disturbs me. The consequences and the potential impact that foreign influence could have upon our national security is staggering. I hope that we can all join together in a bipartisan manner to find out the consequences of this alleged foreign influence. There are a wide range of issues to be explored in this investigation, and we must pursue them in a neutral and nonpartisan manner as best we can. Justice wears a blindfold as a symbol of impartiality, and so too must this committee do so throughout the course of this investigation. Thus far, we have issued subpoenas, conducted depositions, and reviewed documents. I now look forward to hearing the testimony of the witnesses with the hope that what we learn during the course of this investigation will help us to fix our current system of campaign financing. Thank you, and I yield back. 
The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The committee will recess subject to the call of the chair. I'm glad to have the opportunity today to speak before this committee and the American people on the issue of illegal campaign fundraising. I want to repeat that. The topic of these hearings is illegal campaign fundraising. It is illegal for federal candidates to receive contributions from foreign donors. It is illegal to funnel donations through straw donors. It is illegal to solicit contributions on federal property. It is illegal for a federal candidate to coordinate the spending of soft money contributions. These are the issues which this committee is reviewing. We are trying to determine whether the White House, the Democrat National Committee, the President, the Vice President, or others may have broken the law. What confuses me is the attention that is currently be being given to campaign reform initiatives that do not address the rampant rogue behavior in which this administration has engaged. Nothing in legislation before the Congress would have presented, prevented the illegalities we are investigating today because the individuals we are investigating have blatantly and consistently ignored the law. So I ask the members of this committee and the American people to have patience as we sit through this enormous amount of information that is coming to light in this slow, methodical manner. Once we have determined how the laws were broken, and only then will we be able to fix the law. The slow release of information to this committee is the result of a concerted effort by the White House and the Democrat National Committee to delay the investigation. The White House and the Democrat National Committee have resisted our request for cooperation and have snubbed our legitimate subpoenas, which, of course, is a slap in the face of Congress. Unfortunately, we have come to expect this from the White House. I witnessed the repeated resistance from the White House to previous attempts by this committee to get information. What I did not expect was the complexity exemplified by my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to the stonewalling of this administration. When the Congress seeks information, the American people are seeking that information. And any attempt to stifle the Congress is an attempt to shut out the American people. And I hope as we hear the depths of corruption that this committee has uncovered, that we will see a renewed call from the minority of this committee to pursue, pursue the information further. However, even without that cooperation, I have confidence that our chairman, Chairman Burton, and his staff, who I find to be among the most professional of professionals in the House of Representatives today, will get that done for the American people. I hope that as we pursue this investigation, that we can continue to begin the process not only of uncovering the violations of the law, but also how we are going to attempt very carefully to, to make sure that the American people understand this so that we can avoid this in the future. That is the end of my statement. Thank you. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Ford, is recognized for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Sessions. Is a Fellow freshman colleague, it's good to see you sitting in a chairman's chair, even, even if it is for a short period of time. Several months ago, I was back home in my home district of Memphis, Tennessee, for a district work period, and as usual, found myself watching C-SPAN late one evening. I confess I, I have a very light evening schedule, Mr. Chairman. And although I do not remember exactly what conference, convention, speech, or form was being rebroadcast, I clearly remember the story the speaker was telling the audience. And because I believe that it captures the situation confronting this committee and even this Congress as a whole, I want to share it briefly with you today. 
During the middle of the summer, two men met in a small town in Arizona and discovered that they are both traveling to the same place. One of the men has a horse and the other has directions to their destination. But because each man has something that the other one needs, they agreed to embark together upon a journey to their mutual destination. One man supplying the horse, the other the directions. For several days, they ride together until one afternoon it becomes so hot that they decide to stop riding until the sun goes down. After dismounting, the man who owns the horse proceeds to sit down in a small patch of shade created by the horse. Unwilling to sit in the sun, the other man tries to convince his traveling companion that he should get to sit in the shady spot. And what ensues is a heated argument between the two men over who has a right to sit in the shade. The man who owns the horse says he is deserving because, after all, it is his horse. The other man counters that the directions are as important as the horse, so he, too, should get to sit in the shade. As the argument over the shade grows more contentious, the horse gallops away, leaving both men standing with the sun beating down on them. According to our C-SPAN guest, the lesson of this story is not to get caught up too long in arguing over shadows because you risk, you risk losing what really matters, the substance. When I think about this proverb of sorts in the context of our committee's investigation and the Congress as a whole, I can come to only one conclusion. Campaign finance reform is the substance. By that, I do not mean to imply that we should not devote resources and energy to investigating fully and fairly whether laws were broken during the last election cycle. Rather, my point is only that as committee and testified that they were used as conduits for contributions to the Democratic National Committee, which, if proven true, would constitute a violation of laws. Indeed, if it is true, I am deeply troubled by the fact and would like to know not only how and why it happened, but how we can prevent it from occurring again. Notwithstanding all of the assertions and claims to the contrary, what I do not see is evidence that this violation of the law was part of a master plan orchestrated by the Democratic National Committee to funnel overseas money into the Democratic Party. Moreover, it seems to me that the majority party and the majority members of this committee were concerned about the potential impact of foreign or inappropriate contributions to our political system. Then during the last eight months, the committee would have expanded its investigation or at least acknowledged that large sums of foreign money have been funneled into the Republican Party since 1992 from sources inside and outside of Asia, including Germany, Japan, and even Korea. Yet we have heard nothing about these contributions. In fact, if I were sitting at home watching this community committee, committee's activities thus far, excuse me, I might actually believe that all of the allegations raised by the Republican Congress represent the first instance in which there have been accusations that foreign or inappropriate money were con was contributed to a political party. In addition, I might also believe that Mr. Zwang and Tri are the only two people who have ever been accused of using conduits to donate money to our political parties. But the facts are quite different. As recent as 19, July of 1997, Thomas Kramer, a German national, was fined over $300,000 by the FEC for making illegal campaign contributions, almost all of them to the Republican Party. The former co-chair, finance co-chair of the Dole Kemp 96 campaign uh, pled in what I believe was the largest settlement uh, that the FEC was able to negotiate, I believe some five to six million dollars, Mr. Chairman, for using conduits to make contributions to the Dole Kemp campaign. And according to records from the FEC, they are currently investigating 27 conduit payment cases involving 214 respondents. And in the past several years have closed over 21 cases involving 108 respondents. We must recognize, therefore, Mr. Chairman, that the whole system must be fixed. In closing, let me say that I want to get to the truth about campaign contributions during the last election cycle, regardless of where they may lead this committee, regardless of what party may be involved. However, I also want to expose and correct the fundamental flaws in our campaign financing system that have helped to give rise to many of the problems we're confronting today. I would hope, Mr. Chairman and other members of this committee, they would, would use this opportunity not only to talk about the shadow, to argue over the shadow, but also to confront 
the substance. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. The activities of the Democratic National Committee, the President's reelection campaign, and the White House. But these hearings are not and should not be about campaign finance reform. These hearings are about the abuse of power. The President and Vice President of the United States are accused, both in this Congress and on the editorial pages of newspapers across the nation, of breaking the law and hiding facts from the American people. These accusations command this committee. President Clinton returned to Washington to face tough questions about his campaign's very aggressive fundraising effort. The President told the American people that the illegal money that was returned by the Democratic National Committee was not connected with his campaign. If you'll please turn your attention to the monitors. Mr. President, Attorney General Reno is considering whether to appoint an independent counsel to investigate these allegations of improper fundraising by your campaign. She says that she's... Wait, wait, wait. wait. <clears throat> there have been no allegations about by improper fundraising. Well, That's Democratic. correct. Okay, by but the Democratic but Party. Let's see. She says that she's... Copied that was the other copy. campaign that had problems with that, not mine. There have been no allegations about by improper fundraising. Well, That's Democratic. correct. Okay, by the Democratic but Party. Let's see. She says that she's copied. That was the other copy. campaign that had problems with that, not mine. Does anyone want to take up this defense today? The president seems to be saying that someone else is responsible for those illegal contributions totaling more than three and a half million dollars. But this doesn't square with the evidence provided to the committee by the White House. Again, please refer to the monitors. In this April 17th memo from the president's chief White House fundraiser, Harold Ickes, to DNC Chairman Don Fowler, the true chain of command is laid out. The memo is very clear. Every allocation of money at the DNC must first be approved by the President's White House team. The truth is that the President was involved in nearly every aspect of campaign operations. From the drafting of direct mail fundraising letters to routine budget issues, the President was kept informed of goals, projections, and changes in the DNC Clinton Gore fundraising strategy. Even the administration's staunchest defenders cannot deny that the president knew in advance of the election that the campaign plan he and his team had designed violated the law in many ways. In fact, as this last exhibit on the monitor shows, they fully expected they would set a new standard for illegality in a presidential campaign. They budgeted for it. The president's chief political aide told him the campaign would likely be hit with more than $1 million in fines. That is more than five times the largest fine ever imposed on a presidential campaign to that point. Mr. Rickies knew this, Mr. Fowler knew this, and so did the president. They decided to gamble everything on victory in November and sort out the legal defense later. The end, they believed, justified the means. Throughout the many months leading up to these hearings, the administration has developed a highly refined series of explanations for every charge made. And as far as I can tell, there are five steps to this series. Number one, we didn't do it. Number two, we did it, but we didn't mean to. Number three, all right, we meant to, but it's not against the law. Number four, well, all right, it seems to be against the law, but the law doesn't mean what it plainly says. And finally, number five, Okay, we did it, we meant to, it's against the law, the law was clear, but you see, everyone does it. This is something new and disturbing in our political system. It is not uncommon for those accused of a crime to deny it. That's why we have juries. But what does it do to our system of justice to say nothing of our, of our democratic political process when the accused display contempt for the law, when they plead innocence by reason of collective guilt it's a sad fact that this administration's defense of last resort is that the more the law is broken, the less significant the law is, and therefore the less respect it deserves. Their case rests not on the truth, but on their ability to convince the American people that they cannot trust anyone. 
Rather than lay the facts on the table, they gleefully trot out the latest poll showing that Americans have grown even more cynical about all public officials, and they pronounce the public singularly uninterested in these events. Mr. Chairman, whatever the administration would like the American people to believe, when it comes to shady campaign practices, not everyone does it. To my knowledge, no member of this committee does it. We don't accept illegal campaign contributions from churches. We don't launder com contributions through dummy corporations and impoverished nuns. We don't rent our offices to the highest bidder. We don't take money from foreign governments. We don't dial for dollars from our federal offices. We don't move money illegally from one campaign account to another. And none of our campaign workers are hiding out in communist China to avoid subpoenas. We don't all do it, Mr. Chairman, and to suggest that we do is not only unfair to those of us who play by the rules, it is insulting to those who place their trust in us and demeaning to the entire concept of representative self-government. I'd yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The gentleman from Maine, Mr. Allen, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, we're finally here after millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands of documents produced months of wrangling over due process issues and weeks of depositions, the House hearings are about to begin. The questions hang over these hearings. The media may ask, will we learn anything new? Maybe, maybe not. But in my opinion, there are two more important questions that cloud this process. Two in particular go to the heart of this investigation and its role in protecting and improving our democracy. First, is this committee serious or just playing an elaborate game of gotcha on national TV. Second, are the members of this committee as committed to reform as we are to oversight? Or are these hearings just an excuse for inaction on campaign finance reform? With respect to the first question, there are ways to judge seriousness. We need and the American people deserve a full, fair, and even-handed investigation into the 1996 elections. If we rerun the Senate investigation, we're not serious. If we declaim loudly over minor infractions, we're not serious. Early in this session, this committee had the opportunity and the obligation to examine campaign abuses that may have occurred in recent federal election campaigns, both presidential and congressional, Republican and Democrat. But here we are hearing our first witnesses with one month left before we adjourn for the year. This committee has spent almost $3 million. Chairman Burton has issued 127 subpoenas that Senator Thompson has also subpoenaed. S committee staff have deposed 21 individuals who were previously deposed, interviewed, or subpoenaed by the Senate committee. What should we do? Read the Senate transcripts. Read the testimony. Read the Senate depositions that were delivered to majority staff of this committee, but not to the minority. The Thompson hearings are at the stage of almost winding down. We could be more productive if we concentrated on reforming our political finance system instead of plowing old ground with this investigation. I've been holding community meetings in my district recently, and the subject of campaign finance reform always comes up. Last week at a meeting in South Portland, one constituent said, when my wife and I read about contributions of thousands of dollars, it makes, like, it makes what little we've given to candidates over the years seem like bubble gum. He added, we don't want to do it anymore. Soft money contributions to the national parties are undermining this democracy, not just because the very wealthy get access denied to the many. It is also true that soft money, big money, diminishes the role of every voter, every small contributor, and every volunteer. Participation in politics is the lifeblood of this democracy. Big money is turning participants into spectators, grassroots workers into TV ad watchers. It is not a healthy trend. One of my constituents gave me $20 for my campaign last year. He wrote in his letter urging me when I got to Washington not to forget the people from the grassroots who sent me here. What place for, remains for him in a system so addicted to big money? We can't create the perfect system, but we can make this one better. Our bipartisan, bipartisan freshman task force developed a campaign finance reform proposal. It is a good bill. If it had been in place before the 1996 elections, we wouldn't be here at these hearings today. I can't help but believe that this committee, the public would be better off, and we would have done a better job discharging our duties 
if we spent more time on campaign finance reform than we do with this hearing today. The time has come to legislate, not to continue an investigation that seems futile and duplicative. The American people deserve that. The state of our political system demands it. Yet the Republican leadership in the Senate yesterday killed campaign finance reform. We had another and a better option at the beginning of this process. This committee could have undertaken a bipartisan, comprehensive investigation of the 1996 campaign. We could have productively educated the American public in a timely manner. That did not happen. Sadly, I have come to believe that the primary function of this investigation is to provide the majority with an excuse for inaction on campaign finance reform. This is not a good reason for the hearings we begin today. We should legislate, not just investigate. I hope, I still hope, that these hearings will reveal new information that will get to the heart of the abuses in the 1996 campaign. But I fear that the price we pay for these hearings is inaction on campaign finance reform. And the Speaker has said he wants to delay any action until after these hearings are concluded. That, it's not clear to me when that would be. We should have done better, and I believe we still could. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman yields back the balance this time. Mr. Barr of Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, when this committee began to prepare for these hearings many months ago, I had high expectations that it would expeditiously and comprehensively reveal the details behind the many concerns raised over the apparent abuse of government information, resources, and personnel to fuel the re-election effort of a sitting president and vice president of the United States. Although the scale of abuse appeared unprecedented from day one, Mr. Chairman, I was confident that this committee's historic charter to keep the executive branch accountable to the people, combined with your personal dedication to the task, would ensure a successful investigation. But notwithstanding your best efforts, Mr. Chairman, I'm not as sanguine today as I was back then. For the events that have unfolded during the course of preliminaries leading to this hearing have raised a question that simply cannot be answered even by this committee. From the very beginning of this investigative effort, we have witnessed an unrelentingly orchestrated attempt by some on the other side of the aisle to change the subject from past wrongs to so-called future reforms. Like the youngster who murders his parents only to throw himself at the mercy of the court as a poor orphan, we have had a steady drumbeat to change the subject from the world of past violations to the world of future improvements. The constant campaign to change the subject has been insidiously assisted by a concerted effort by the highest officials in the executive branch to obstruct, to obfuscate, to dissemble, and to delay interminably the production of documentary evidence subpoenaed by this committee. The most recent revelations that tapes existed of White House fundraising activities that miraculously escaped notice for months of pending subpoenas from this committee is only the most recent indication that the official process by which we govern ourselves in this republic has been made a complete mockery by this administration. We read, we read a letter, more accurately, Mr. Chairman, that might be described as a defense brief, authored by the Attorney General of the United States, stating that selling access to the highest offices in the land is okay. Mr. Chairman, with that attitude prevailing at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, I suppose it should come as no surprise that we're having to deal constantly with delays and obstruction from the other side in this committee. Mr. Chairman, as we open what should be among the most important series of hearings ever conducted in this body, let me make three brief observations. One, a refusal to comply with congressional subpoenas has nothing to do with campaign finance reform. It has everything to do with illegality. Two. An abuse of public office through its sale to foreign interests has nothing to do with campaign finance reform. It has everything to do with illegality. Three, obstruction of justice by impeding government investigations has nothing to do with campaign finance reform. It has everything to do with illegality. Mr. Chairman, let us be mindful of what history teaches us about such matters. 23 years ago this past July, the House Judiciary Committee voted to recommend that President Nixon be impeached. In its three articles of impeachment, the committee charged the President with high crimes and misdemeanors, including obstruction of justice, 
abuse of office, and unlawful refusal to comply with congressional subpoenas. As we look over the past few years of executive branch misconduct, and especially over the last several months, from the unlawful firing of the White House travel staff to make way for political cronies, to the securing without any lawful authority of the confidential files of the FBI of those persons considered White House enemies, to the phone calls from government offices for hard money campaign donations, to the raising of funds from illegal foreign sources, and now to obstruction, we are struck by the sorry state to which our executive branch has fallen. The people of this republic depend for their common welfare and defense on an individual elected to the highest office in the land who is sworn to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Mr. Chairman, that question, the question that America asks is, where is that person? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time, and we will stand adjourned until tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock.